oops, I shouldn't have made that comment on social media because, oh, maybe he was innovative. Maybe nobody was taking it as far as he was. Maybe he, oh my God, he's had 40 songs that are simply mind-blowing. I appreciate you doing this. This podcast is about you and your journey in music. And we'll talk about all the reissues you have coming out. Okay, I was born, I played metal in a metal band, and then I died. How's that? <laughs> Sums it up. I love it. You just <laughs> want to use audio only? No video? Yeah. Okay, cool. Hey, sure. I, I don't have my uh, my makeup and my, my hair. People here, nothing, man. All good. I, uh, you all can, good. You know what? For this one, you can if you want. If there's permission already access, I don't care. It's just... All the interviews I was doing, I was thinking I'm, I'm sitting in the, my studios turned off. I'm sitting in the same place doing the same nonstop same, same scenery. And I thought, I don't want all this stuff coming out with the same background. I know it sounds stupid, but no, I don't want to keep, I don't want to keep running around the house, moving my laptop. I'm lazy. <laughs> well, I appreciate you letting oh, us you use the video. Only this one. Okay, cool, cool. Well, awesome. Well, thank you again so much for doing this. My name is Adam. and Thank you. Thank first off, you. Talk to me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> talk to me about where you were born and raised. Well, um, I was born uh, just outside of Toronto, Canada, uh, okay. 19, 1966, which means I'm a 55-year-old fart who thinks he's 16 <laughs> or 6. More like 6, my wife says. Um, <laughs> yeah, just uh, grew up on... Uh, I don't know, just grew up, my, my mom decided, uh, she, she got the idea that I kept staring at guitar players. Uh, that would, that's the one thing that would keep me focused. I had, I guess I was never officially diagnosed, but my, my uh, father and son both were diagnosed with ADHD. So, and a form that they could get through life and they could deal with it without medication and they could mm. figure it out. But you, you had to be aware you had it and know what to, how to calm yourself and focus. Uh, um, and I was never diagnosed, but I'm going to assume I, it didn't skip me. So sure. one thing, that, one thing that kept my attention, my mom figured out was, uh, anybody playing guitar, I was just mesmerized. And then, um, yeah, just went through, I, she got me guitar lessons when I was seven or eight, you know, like the big oversized folk guitar and you're just mm -hmm. strumming a couple of chords and learning the basics lessons once a week for an hour or a half hour. And, but I was actually coming home and practicing it and. My mom was like, wow, like this kid's like, he should be on Ritalin at the time or should have been, you know, like calm the hell down. We need drugs for this kid and uh, wow. he can't focus. And this focused me. Um, wow. And that was it. From then on, I found my medication. That was my medicine through life, uh, through the good and bad times and keeping me stable. And not that, not that I would be instable or unstable, but it really helped me calm my life down a little bit because it's not a calm business. It's not a calm type of music. It's not a calm life. Sure. So, um, and then I, I, you know, I discovered, I remember, you know, I went through disco cause I was a kid and I remember I was made for loving you and I'm like, Oh man, kiss. But my first albums were things like, uh, Elton John's greatest hits. And I love, uh, you know, not the Nickelback version, but the, uh, which I like, by the way, the, um, the original one had this clangy guitar in there and I was hearing this guitar stuff. And I'll always be attracted to music um, that had guitar in it. And, of course, my first album was Saturday Night's uh, Greatest Hits, Elton John. I, I remember The Sweet when Desolation Boulevard came out. That blew my mind. That was, and it is still, it's got to be in the top, I'd say top 20 most classic albums in rock of all time. That's probably the most underrated album. Mm -hmm. And then then the other ones I bought were um, Kiss Alive 2 and Dis uh, Love Gun. Love Guns, my favorite Kiss album, and then um, same here. I love that record. Then it was, it was just yeah, and and just you know the imagery was one thing, but I kind of felt as a little you know ten year old, whatever, twelve year old, the Gene Simmons spitting blood and all this you know up on these these risers with dragons on them and the flames and smoke shooting out. At the time, that was the Ramstein stage show of that era. Oh sure, and that was kind of like. Um, and I think my story is the same as a lot of people in the world, especially in the oh, all around the world. That's one of those things where you go, okay, I like the music and I play guitar lessons and, and all this, but I want to be in a fucking rock and roll band. You know, that's when that, I want to be in a band was like, 
there it's born right there when you saw kiss you were like oh my god you know so anyway same story with everybody dime bag all the way up and down the age scale you know usually sure. the older you are the more you know that one but um <laughs> yeah so anyway i just went on you know i i found things like um when i was young i'd find the early scorpion stuff and um <clears throat> just rock, hard rock acdc of course van halen was just groundbreaking for my brain and uh, music uh but i i very quickly learned that all the other kids and teenagers early teenagers and teenagers in ottawa and everyone was trying to do his solos and hammer-ons and all these things mm -hmm. when when i i was thinking hang on i'm not going to learn that stuff because everybody else is trying to do it um i'm not going to be a groundbreaker i'm sure but at least i'm not going to be copying like everybody else is and i started focusing in on going he's one of the most amazing rhythm guitar players in history but also one of the most amazing songwriters so it's like hang on there's a million guys that can play this lead guitar stuff mm -hmm. but they're not writing good songs and they're not playing rhythms they're just everybody's going to see them to to make this noise that is great and technically great but i didn't want to sit in my room nine hours a day and practice scales and solos i sure. wanted to go out and play malcolm young rhythms and and you know all this you know rock and roll aerosmith rocks album was a big one for me um i heard these two guitar players whitford and perry uh -huh. and they're playing different parts and i'm like isn't that like my friends band uh, the, the the band my friends like uh that are in that dope smoking crowd uh, the rolling stones where <laughs> two, two guitar players play different music and uh -huh. that went on to influence aerosmith's two guitars and went on next to, to Guns N' Roses, where you had Izzy Stradlin and Slash playing different parts in a song. Mm -hmm. um, in contrast to Metallica, ACDC, uh, Exodus, where you've got two players on each side playing almost identical and perfectly. And to get that perfection, ACDC had the, high, or had the knowledge of, wait a second, why don't we get the guitar player is playing this one perfectly to play the other speaker's guitar so that's identical playing uh -huh. and so i started picking up on that as a kid and a teenager and therefore i focused on players that could do all three write songs play solos and play rhythms uh -huh. now you're looking at in heavy metal you're looking at a guy named glenn tipton because he could write from judas priest he could write uh -huh. songs classics at all different areas of his career he could play guitar in a certain way that was amazing and bluesy but then on the painkiller album in 1990 he shocks the elite guitar world and is playing stuff that's almost racer x influence because i'm sure scott travis the new drummer on that album had an influence in playing this music to tipton mm -hmm. and he he changes his lead style of decades and goes to school again and starts playing these sweeps and these crazy licks that he'd never done before. So he must have went into his room, back to basics, and practiced for a few years, something new. Mm -hmm. um, but he could play all three. And if I, people, you know what? You can insert questions and edit it and put all these questions in because I'm answering every question known to me. No, man. this is what <laughs> I love about this because I, it's just all about you and your, what you know your journey. I love hearing all this stuff because there's a lot of things I didn't have any clue about. So cool. please continue. Well, I, <laughs> I, I appreciate you um, accepting and honoring my ADHD. Um, oh man, I love it's, it. It's, if you slow it down, you'll you'll hear some things in there that might make sense. But uh, I think guys like Tipton and Eddie Van Halen, mm -hmm. I'd say like people would always say, "Oh, what's your favorite guitar player?" I'd say for heavy metal, it's Glenn Tipton because he's got all three of those things. Dave Mustaine has the rhythm and the songwriting and his leads are good, but Tipton has the writing, the leads and the song. He's got them all like a top level. So mm -hmm. Kirk Hammett, he's groundbreakingly original for solos. He mm -hmm. wrote some of the, 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 um, inner Sandman and some other classic riffs, but James is the rhythm guy. James sure. is the song, right? The songwriter. So you, yeah. you, can go, you can tell me anyone, you can go saturate Vi, and I'll say, okay, Vi innovation super great soloist super great rhythm player but if you look at actual non-musician songwriting and hits i'm not saying it has to be hit for it to be good 
Mm-hmm. But we even even Vi just said recently, we all know everyone, Satch, Vi, Mom's team, they they've all been talking about Eddie because he passed and and that. But if you look at the timeline, when Van Halen's Diver Down showed up um in 1980, what was it, two or three? There was shuffles, there was a new style, there was a little keyboard vibe, there was some effects going on. And the beginnings of that big shuffle that the next album, 1984, would show us with Hoffer Teacher on Alex mm-hmm. Van Halen's shuffle intro and the boogie. And therefore, Satriani got latched onto that. And there's a Satch boogie type of thing. Mm-hmm. Vi went into that. Everybody else latched onto those two albums and went. And you know why they did it? Likely part of it was because that was what was in and it would help get a deal or a better deal or get more audience possibly uh-huh. because Van, Van Halen were the biggest band in the world at that time, but literally, I mean, literally were North America. Um, but they also copied that Van Halen groove and style and everything is because deep down behind the music business and the record deals and the, the whole I'm Steve, I, Oh, I'm, I'm not putting myself in the same category, but even Jeff waters or any of us at uh-huh. any level, we did that because we fucking loved his guitar playing and you couldn't deny that hendrix may have been innovative in coming up with sounds and crazy feedback and noises Uh but he didn't have a catalog of songs and rhythms like eddie did and you know you you can argue who's the best so to speak it's all like who you like who who Uh i like martin Knopfler. i like malcolm young and angus i like there's so many people i like but if it comes down to those three, songwriting, lead, and, and rhythm, um, Eddie, and then mm-hmm. you continue that and go, oh, by the way, if you do find somebody that has all three of those and you think can rival Eddie Van Halen, look at the empire of, of gear, look at the innovations with whammy bars, drop detuning, detuna pieces of guitar, putting humbuckers in place of normal Strat pickups. Every guitar company did that as soon as he came out. He had so many innovations with the guitar and with electronics and pedals and, and all these things and tubes and, and I didn't realize that he was kind of the first with a humbucker. He was the first guy to come up with a dozen things that we, we as guitar players have been using and are discovering decades later that, wait a sec, that was Eddie that actually told that guy at the company, this is what's needed. Mm -hmm. And, And you start going, he was the first to really do waxing pickups to stop the feedback. And then every company is doing some form of pickup waxing ever since then. So there's a whole lot of innovations that he did. And of course, he had a cult following of everybody trying to duplicate his sounds. And he intentionally, whether it was Roth that told him to or not, depending on the story, he intentionally was leaking out information of how he got his famous Brown sound, which is actually was the name for his brother's drum kit sound but got misinterpreted as that's the brown sound is Eddie's guitar sound. Um, oh, it wasn't. interesting. I didn't know that. It was actually the drum <laughs> sound. That Eddie was speaking of his brother uh, having the brown sound, and the press picked it up as, oh, that must mean Eddie Van Halen's guitar sound. So we've been seeking the brown sound for decades, and Eddie would intentionally leak out misinformation about how he got it. So there, there would be a literally an art is before the internet, there'd be an army of hundreds of thousands of people, probably a hundred thousand around the world that would at various degrees, levels of how much they were into it. They would be trying to recreate the sound using the clues and tips that he had told us. There's people back before the internet. And now to this day, analyzing little shitty blurry photos of him in the studio and sunset, whatever, all around the world on stage, zooming in on pedal boards, zooming in on amps, zooming in on microphones. And it's a cult thing that we knew when we were, when you're this old and you were in the business back then, Mm -hmm. people were lining up at bookstores, magazine shops and music stores just to get the latest guitar player or guitar world, guitar player magazines. Yeah. because, Because Eddie Van Halen was doing an interview. So if you can imagine today, you don't see it, but, in my little hometown of Ottawa, which wasn't really that metal or rock and roll of a city, uh-huh. there would be two, two, three hundred of us taking off school or work to line up in the morning at 6 a.m. to buy the new guitar player magazine that had the interview with Eddie in it so we could find out what he was doing. And wow. this is what kids don't know today, and it's understandable, but 
I feel like it's my part-time job to mention it because <laughs> uh, he his life's work was just it wasn't the the guy that you know was like uh, had this real tough period drinking wine and whatever else he was doing that you see on you know on the social media you can see the bad parts of everybody's life or things that weren't the best mm -hmm. um what people are slowly figuring out now the younger generations are slowly figuring out now that oops i shouldn't have made that comment on social media because oh maybe he was innovative maybe nobody was taking it as far as he was maybe he oh my god he's had 40 songs that are simply mind-blowing mm -hmm. you know so anyway so that's my plug for eddie but it's not a plug it's just he was like my second father in a way because uh music's my life and i have my dad who gave me what he gave me and and that's like the best i had one of the best fathers ever um but then to have the second guy there and watch him go up and down and fall and, and the different things he did in his life uh was just like it feels like a, a dad like i knew the guy i didn't sure <laughs> so. sure yeah definitely i mean if you follow someone's career it's you you can get to know them like what you you think is them you know on a, on that level or that basis. well i didn't i didn't really say this to many people but i used my annihilator career which basically in a nutshell to anybody who doesn't know us we our first three albums were released in our home country canada and the states uh from 89 to 93 mm -hmm. then we were dropped and told that unless we were and, and understandably at that time we were literally told unless you change the name of your band get some different musicians and sound like pantera sepultura or biohazard we gotta let you go because that's what labels were doing in 1993 they were cleaning house of anything that wasn't selling anything that had the word heavy metal or metal in their bio and cleaning house of it because that's how bad it was there was no internet to let everybody know but all the bands got dropped except for the bigger ones and the the funny story I, i'm doing the old grandpa or dad thing here but back in the time when you know the 80s and then early 90s <clears throat> up to about 91 he did have the painkiller album come out by priest he did have um uh jesus megadass rust in peace 1990 those and and Annihilator's biggest record was 1990 as well, called Never Neverland. Um, but the thing is, if you were part of the big bands, you weren't dropped necessarily, but you lost Bruce Dickinson. And then your your sales and your your touring stuff went down. And you lost Rob Halford. Oh, and you yeah. got a new singer. And all of a sudden, you're, you've been playing for a decade and a half in Vancouver, playing the big arenas. And all of a sudden in Vancouver, you're back to 86th Street Music Hall, which is a club. So I, mm -hmm. I saw the mighty priest in a club. So, wow. And, and, and Slayer was playing the arena circuits at the uh -huh. end of the, the eighties and early nineties, all of a sudden Slayer were playing a club called, uh, the Commodore ballroom in Vancouver. And I was, it was the type of place where you sit on the sides of the club on a little riser, you have 15 tables and your waitress can give you a roast beef sandwich, French fries, and a Coca-Cola. So while Slayer's playing, <laughs> while Slayer's playing, so it's a classy, classy venue, but we're only talking 1500 people when it used to be 10,000. So I watched that with my career going alongside, mm -hmm. um, from 93 on, I was gone from my own country and gone from the States. I was done. Um, I you got lucky moved in, out of Canada. Well, moved out of no, Canada. no, I was in, uh, sorry. I was gone from the music scene in oh, north okay. america because nobody wanted to sign us so mm -hmm. 1994 a year later came by and my manager had somehow uh said you need to come down to the office in vancouver and, and talk and i was all bummed out for almost i guess about seven months eight months and uh he said i said well i i do have an offer from a uh, a company to to write some songs and to do some things and later on it would be a video game company that we all know made some great video games and um, I started writing songs with a guy from Nashville and I wrote a lot of country and pop hits, oh, wow. uh, ball ballads in, in the United States. Um, and some, you know, everything from like, you remember American Idol and all the Idol shows. Oh, yeah. where like the big, you'd, I get these things from the publisher and my writing partner, Hey, the second or third or fourth place winner, you know how they'd send them all on a tour and they'd all do albums. Oh, so yeah. I'd, get, I'd get the call to, Hey, we need this type of song written. And they'd be like, it's gotta be like Elton John meets a real commercial Metallica song, you know, and I'm like, okay, here we go. 
And so I was doing like theme songs for entertainment tonight type shows and in the States. And it was a couple of years where I, I did it to survive because I guess metal was dead. Right. Um, right. So was it difficult or to, to switch gears and stop, no, you know, it, you're it was, writing metal was, to. No, it was very metal. short. It was very short. And back then you had a choice. You take an instant paycheck for, for your work, your music uh, for a, uh, let's say a TV show wanted to use my song. Mm -hmm. You sometimes had an option where you get a percentage of when it kept every time it gets played. So if it was on a big show, you would get that forever. You get little, little bits coming in yeah. for the rest of your life or the paycheck. And I, my writer partner who was very famous, he wrote like a lot of Shania Twain's first, first record and before Mutt Lang and uh, Janet Jackson, Paul Abdul, whole bunch of cool, varied country stuff and everything. And he wrote lyrics. I wrote the music. And he he uh, he said, Jeff, don't go for the royalty shit because you got to maintain it. You get statements. You get all this stuff. Go for the paycheck. And I'm like, what do you mean? <laughs> he goes, well, we write a song. We offer it to John Bon Jovi's solo album. And if they want it, they're going to pay you for that song. And there's your there, there's your and it's gone. And I was like, OK, let's do that. And, and it worked. But before I could actually get really into it and start making a career of it, um, my manager said, I don't know why you're bummed out. Japan and, and Europe and England have been sending offers to sign you guys for the last six months. You wow. just haven't been you just haven't been answering my calls and coming in to the Meetings. to the shop. Because I was I was <laughs> I, I just thought it was over. Right. And even the the label guy at Roadrunner told me as a joke, and I didn't find it very funny at all. Uh, I guess you might have to unless you're willing to change everything. Uh, we're not interested. And, and the quote was something also like, uh, well, you can always cut your hair short and get a real job. You know, that joking comment like that, right? Uh -huh. That doesn't, that did not go well with me. I, I was like a dagger, right. but it was also, also a, uh, just made you feel terrible about because you're a metal fan. You've, you've done three albums that sold million something records yeah. and you, you, you toured with Judas Priest on their painkiller tour. And you did all these headline tours in Europe and all these experiences and meeting your idols. And then all of a sudden you're told as a joke to cut your hair and get a real job yeah, or yeah. so that was a big Start, blow. But then yeah. a, year, a year later, I did a record called King of the Kill signed to a, a European, a, a British and a Japanese company signed a publishing deal for Europe, publishing deal for Japan, which I didn't know what it was, but I was <laughs> to learn. So four deals in two territories and I'd made more money in that than the first three records that were my big ones times five. So it was kind of wow. like I, so basically I bought a house, built a recording studio and mm -hmm. this is off. Like this is in the dead time when all the bands were getting dropped. I was like, okay, maybe I got something in Europe and Japan and maybe I should focus my energy there. Mm -hmm. So I essentially couldn't get back into the States and Canada, but they welcomed me and we went over and had all the big tours and albums. And it's like number two in Japan, Bon Jovi was first place. I remember all that stuff in 95 and I was buying cars. I got a place down south in the Caribbean. I had a house. I had two, three cars, something. I was blowing all my money. I'll tell you that right now. And it was gone. Like it, it went within three years, but I had a house. I had a studio. Now I could record my own music and not have to pay people. Mm -hmm. um, I learned about engineering. I learned about all this stuff. And I said, I'm just going to go where people want my band. And I stayed in Europe and stayed in Japan, a bit of South America. And when I finally said, okay, metal seems to be coming back in the United States. My time was 2007. I tried to get in and it was a, it was a blow. It was a blow to the ego and a reality check because just because you do okay in other places and you've had a bit of a good career and you're living the, not the high life, but you're living a good life. Mm -hmm. And then you think you're going to waltz into a territory like Canada or especially the United States and say, okay, here I am again. Here's my demo of my new record. It was a reality check because it was like, wait, you missed the boat. Your music is totally dated. You're not an innovator like Pantera. You're not doing the, the Children of Bodom, Trivium, Lamb of God. You're not doing that Pantera-y or Screamo-y or New Metal-y stuff. You are an old 80s fart playing the same kind of maiden-y, priest-y, ACDC-y with a bit of Metallica and Slayer in there. Mm -hmm. You're doing melodic heavy metal with some thrash in it. That's not what the people want to hear. So when I went back in to get it, it was gone. It was not offered. And I was like, oh, shit. So mm -hmm. what do I do? I go back and focus my efforts overseas. And 
in hindsight, for sure, I was right to be denied. The music I was doing was probably not the right thing, but I should have worked harder to get into those territories. And but I wasn't because I was in nice tour buses with a lot of crew and good tours. And you're sitting here literally figuring out how much merchandise money you'll profit from at the end of the tour to pay a mortgage or to to do stuff with your band, which is good. That's making a living. It's my music. I'm fucking working it. But right, right. I, I should have reinvested into losing money to go back into a couple of luxury bands and done the real work that the other bands were doing that I refused to do. So that's, I get what I pay for. If I don't want to do the hard work, you're not going to get it. So a lot of people go, well, you must not like your home country of Canada or your the US, you hate us or something. And I'm like, no, I think Canada is probably one of the best countries in the world to live in. And the United States is literally a like, literally like 50 plus countries all in one. And I'm in the United States as a tourist every year, going to Vegas, LA, New York, every, but not just the hot spots. I'm going everywhere, traveling, Kentucky, driving, you know, getting a tent and going camping. I'm, I'm like, it's like, I love the country, but musically I couldn't get back in. So right, and if you I, couldn't do what you love there, then why would you stay? And I mean, or be I could have, I could have made more of an effort, but I, you know, at that point I was in my thirties. I said, you know what, just stick to where you're at for your job that's doing well, and you're doing honest music that you love doing. You're not, you know, tapping in on image, tapping in on a sound or something that's current to get in, and you're not hiring different producers to change your vocal vocal styles and music to try to sell records like a lot of bands were doing and some were successful it was just a point of hey man this is what you do just make it simple and go where you're wanted and just be honest and good about it and, and it, it worked and nobody heard of us really in north america finally except the old school people and then finally the internet came out and i thought oh they'll discover us then nope and then later later so many were discovered and then it got to the point where people were looking for something different in metal and we got lucky because hey this band what these guys have had 17 studio records yeah. and we both we heard they did a song alice in hell back in the 80s that's all we knew about uh -huh. and then leading to this new record i'm doing all that career overseas doing all this stuff with all these studio records they were not available so when we went to this COVID disaster sure i took stock of a few things because i got COVID. my wife got it and kids got it and i got it really bad because i'm older i was an ex-smoker uh -huh. i don't drink alcohol for three decades but i still am not an exerciser i didn't drink a lot of water i in took a lot of fast foods and and uh, you know i i keep my weight down to an acceptable level for being a musician but i wasn't skinny and i wasn't fit or slim or you know, fat free. I was a gut guy. It was all in the gut and uh -huh. you wear the bigger black shirts and hide it with the guitar. In the photos, you would, you would flex <laughs> your, you'd flex your muscle to make it look like you were, you know, so Buff. people thought they were, the people thought they would meet me in Europe all the time. And they figured a six foot muscular, badass son of a bitch. And they get there and it's like, Oh, he's barely five ten. He's got a little, little bit of a belly and he's a goofball. So, and with funny, <laughs> funny hair and, and he's like a normal weirdo. So, um, so that image thing was just not, I wasn't interested in trying to project something. I was trying to save my ass from looking overweight and out of shape, but the, the whole thing, the, basically what it was, was the pandemic hit. I got COVID mm -hmm. bad. I had the thing where the elephant was sitting on your chest for two weeks oh and I was, I was, I was wheezing like a crackling fire. That's how I explained it whether it was in or out breath, it was a crackling fire. And I was like, you were told not to pop asthma medication because that could make it worse. And really, and then afterwards, uh, well, my oxygen level got tested and they said, dude, you should probably be in the hospital. And the, the hospital didn't say dude, but you should <laughs> probably have the, the airway put down. If your uh -huh. if your oxygen level gets any lower, you need to be in the hospital. And um, my wife watched me all day and night and in another room and make sure I was okay. I isolated because I was scared. Ter we were all terrified over here, right? like everywhere. And um, I recovered partially in about two weeks. I woke up and the elephant was gone. So it was like, well, okay, it, he's not sitting on my chest anymore. Um, 
but it took six to seven months. And now I understood what I heard was, I thought was such a goofy term. Uh, long COVID, I was thinking, oh, it's another political bunch of bullshit. Right. And then I understood it, that that was real. COVID was real, but that was real because it took over six months. And then I woke up one morning and went, oh, the other half of my lungs are back. So wow. I went through six and a half months of, oh shit, did I just damage my lungs? And is my career and maybe even life done here? Right. And I was, I was back. Then I had toe surgery, an infection. <laughs> Then I had, no, get ready. This is fucking awesome. Excuse my F language. I didn't you mean to cuss. say that. <laughs> Passionate. I'm, I'm, I'm impulsive. I said a bad word. Um, toe surgery, an infection. Then I had um, kidney stones because I ate. I thought being healthy was eating a shit ton of, of spinach salad every night for three years. And that's oh, yeah. one, of the, one of the main causes of kidney stones. Yep, there's a lot of spinach. Dehyd Dehydration, antibiotics, and spinach uh -huh. are three, and genetics, but three of the big ones. And I was doing everything wrong. So I experienced uh, about three absolutely brutal, and everybody who's had one usually knows that these kidney stones are almost the worst pain anyone can ever have. So that was a bunch of hospital visits, and they'd, <sighs> they'd, they'd use this sounder thing on your back. It was like they'd blast the stone, um, and that was painful. They'd do that, and the stone would break up, and I'd whatever get pee it out the next day whatever but something was causing it obviously um i didn't figure it out till later and then even worse i'd had um severe groin pain for a long time and it, it when i was touring and it got worse and worse mm -hmm. and it was a hernia i'd ripped the abdominal wall in my oh gut my gosh. and i was of course the unlucky one that had to have the full abdominal open surgery not the little laparoscopic tiny little inch mm -hmm. Uh, incisions uh, yeah. and, and, and you're back to work in a week. This was, um, it, I'm now seven months after the surgery and I can only walk up to 30 minutes a day. I won't be up to an hour a day until the end of the year. Oh, wow. I mean, till, um, for another four or five months and I can't start proper, uh, core rehab because it's still a problem. Um, mm -hmm. I was only able two months ago to be able to sit in my studio here and actually work. I, 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 I would try and I'd sit and I'd last 15 minutes and then I'd be in such pain. I'd have to go back and lie down. And when you're lying down and you're in pain, what do, what do a lot of us do? We take painkillers. Then we take codeine. Mm -hmm. We try to stay away from all the harder painkillers. And I stayed right. on codeine, codeine and Tylenol basically. And I stayed on that for months and I limited it. So it was half the dose daily dose that the doctor said and thought that that was enough. And then when I realized I don't think I need it anymore, I was totally in electrical shock when I went through the withdrawal from it and I had to wean down from it. Uh -huh. So here I am with this massive incision from belly button to waist with all the internal stuff cut up and reattached and all that kidney stones, COVID scared to death, the media and the, a lot of the leaders in the media obviously took advantage of that and really scared us. Um, and didn't tell us all the the facts and data and all that but you know it was and is real um and i didn't get the delta thing if i'd got that i, I i'm really like oh my god that if that is that much worse if it is worse than the original mm -hmm. i would have been done right so but anyway luckily i had it got the immunity from it and went through it and, and survived it and um well not that i was near death but almost I mean, it sounds like you almost went to the hospital <laughs> yeah, yeah well, i was at the, i was at the i was at the hospital they wouldn't let me in and they they did me the, the tests for the for the lung capacity and they said you're one or two percent more I take this thing home if it gets to one or two percent less you need to come in and get intubated or the oxygen thing or whatever oh, yeah. so i was right i was right there and and i was very lucky i think i was very i realized i was lucky um so moving on this whole thing makes you realize then you recover from all this shit and now i'm getting through this abdominal surgery. And I've been working for two months in my studio. I've had some people in, I've been working, having fun, doing a lot of good stuff. And um, the thing about that is way back, it made me realize, okay, you're, you're 50, at the time, 54, early 54 years old, I'm 55 now. What if you died tomorrow? My first thought was, okay, I got my family in order. Everybody's happy, everybody be okay. They know I love them. We got mm -hmm. that done. That, that's usually an issue that many people have like realize is not fixed and not done 
and I had that all sewn up. They know I love them. They, they, okay. you know, they, I, I'm one of these Van Halen type guys where you go and kiss everybody, you know, but anyway, <laughs> um, so, and hug. Um, but the thing is I didn't have my, I had my annihilator business in order to an extent, but I did not have my 17 albums, studio albums, plus all these live and DVD releases. I didn't have that house in order. So I went back and said, okay, if there's somebody in the United States or Canada that eventually wants to hear this Annihilator band and here's all these, there's all these records, they can't even find it on Spotify or iTunes. Most of them are not there. You can't order the hard physical copy or LPs, most of them, or on eBay from Europe, maybe, and it costs you $50, ridiculous. So I said, okay, I need to at least get my whole catalog available if I can pull that off so that any time in the future, somebody actually wants to hear the stuff, they can hear it. So mm -hmm. that was all I needed to do and everything else was good. So I did it. I had uh, a lot of good deals. I did that were not real deals. They were licensed deals. So I own the rights and I had a total of 20 titles. I was able to deal with last year. And I said, okay, 20 titles out of the 26 or whatever, or 23. Um, I got them. So I want to go to a label. I don't want to license them out, which is the smart business move. I mm -hmm. don't want to do a normal record deal, which is the one where now the label has all the power and the, the percentage of profit so high that they will throw you out in the road and give you money to go on a tour bus for two years. They will buy advertisements and make sure you're touring with Metallica and they'll make sure all that because they're the ones to gain right. when it they're all sells. Get the money when it sells, right. But I, but I ain't getting it because I'm just a musician that's working it for them i did the third deal which is you're seeing this a lot with publishing with recording rights now uh people are having to sell rights because they are losing their houses or losing their their careers and even the the multi-millionaires are having to deal that off because you know it's a sad thing but if you own an eight million dollar house you've got taxes and upkeep and you've got all oh, this yeah. stuff involved and you know whether you're you you're worth eight cents or eight million or 80 well i don't know about 80 million but 8 million you, you need to you're like these are tough times if you haven't prepared for this stuff so mm -hmm. i just i was different i i was like fuck i don't care my life's good everything's financially is good i've got this most badass studio in england for mixing um so and that's pretty arrogant but it's true um <laughs> it's very nice in here it's like it's just been totally done no holds barred it, just to be a beautiful environment to mix an album and record it's got you know amps and stuff in there and uh -huh. stuff but it's it's basically a mixing room for any kind of music um but uh you know financially i was smart for the last eight years before covid and finally smartened up so i just happened to be in this lucky position when this pandemic hit my album had already been released i toured before the album instead of after for it and i was pretty much done the album pre-sold sold out sold more later i did the tour uh, went home for Christmas. Then the album came out. I sat at home and enjoyed the holidays. Mm -hmm. Then the album did fantastic. And then the, the pandemic hit. So I was fine that way when my friends in the business from everywhere were actually not fine. They were losing their minds, their relationships, drug, alcohol was taken over. Mm -hmm. That was their only way they could make a living and pay the rent. The mortgage bills was to tour. I was the opposite. I was like, Hey, I'm good. Do you need any help? So I was trying to help out a few of my friends and, and you know them like people in well-known bands, believe it or not, they don't have the money that we think they do. A lot of them, some do mm -hmm. like, of course, Metallica. Right. Uh, right. But you know, you'd think Slayer would be so well off, so rich. And so, well, maybe a few guys are doing fucking amazing and they deserve it. But there are a few guys connected to the band that, right. You know, uh -huh making right? I, yeah or not what you money. think they, they're still making money and they're still going to live a nice life but they still have to work to maintain that lifestyle right mm -hmm. and it's not a ridiculous lifestyle it's just we've all had to tighten our belts and all that fun stuff that mom and dad told me um so the thing though is i kind i didn't i wasn't cocky about it but i i literally when it hit i realized well at least i'm okay in these areas and then i got COVID. then i had the hernia surgery then the kidney stones then the toe operations and then, oh my God, my catalog's a fucking mess. So I did that catalog deal. Uh, of course, I the, the best way to make a record company promote whatever it is you're, you're doing or giving them 
is if they financially put in a lot of money, they need to do the work to make that money back. Otherwise, they're really stupid business people. So my goal was to try to find a label that would give me the maximum amount of money and was doing very well, but also could take a catalog of old stuff and know what to do with it and make it available. So that was the deal. Give me a bank wire for this much money and you legally promise that you'll make it available on all platforms now around the world and future platforms and you can have the whole damn thing. And that's what I did. And I was able to say pandemic life back to when I was born, everything I've ever done is now dealt out. I don't have to worry about companies around the world sending statements and, and you know, lying about statements and lying about sales and all this shit and depressing me every six months. It's more like, hey, I got paid for my work, move on to the future. And that's, that's really, once that was sold off, now I could deal with the present, which is get my health in order, have my studio flourishing, so to speak, with music coming out of it, even if it's not mine, um, and get back to what do I want to do? And what I want to do is I want to do a reunion sort of anniversary tour, 30, 31, 33 year anniversary tour of my first three albums and get the original singers on those three albums to come back. Oh, awesome. The first guy passed away, Randy Rampage on our album, Alice in Hell, passed mm -hmm. away uh, 2018. So a friend of mine who was always a singer I wished was in Annihilator called Stu Block. He was in Iced Earth. He's in a band called I Into Eternity now again. He has always been my the guy I wanted to play with my band, but uh, Iced Earth guy, John Schaefer, got him before I could get him. And so now I got him. And it was like, would you do the tour as Randy Rampage would do? So the Alice in Hell album. And he goes, I'll do you one up. I know the two other singers are iffy because you don't know if, if 20, 30 years later that these old school guys are even in physical condition to do a tour. Right. So he said, I'll learn the other two albums. So if one of them just, you know, for health reasons or whatever, just can't make it, I'll cover for the guy. So wow. was bonus. So where we're at with this catalog that I should be talking about in a nutshell, to take that catalog and get rid of it, so to speak, and know it's in good hands and get on with the future. They, they interrupted the future for a second and said, listen, it's not new stuff. It's an old catalog. We know what it is. Can you help us to try to do something to at least announce that we have the catalog coming up in the next year and a half? Like they're going to increment or slowly release the titles with bonus tracks, vinyls, all this cool extra stuff that everybody tries to do. <clears throat> but how can you kick it off? Is there anything we can do? And I said, hmm, what if I picked, well, there was one album that I've always wanted to redo part of the tracks because the three main guys, myself, Mike Mangini, who's the drummer in Dream Theater and mm -hmm. uh, Steve by Extreme, Annihilator for a few albums, and Dave Padden, my 12-year run singer, the three of us were in the perfect storm of being distracted with other things going on that we did not spend the right amount of time or no creativity on the tracking process on, on on playing the drums singing the feel wasn't there with the singing yet those guys had done brilliant albums and performances with me on other ones but not that one and i fucked up the mix i fucked up the engineering side the scheduling i goofed my end up too mm -hmm. so i thought i'll redo that one because it's not like redoing a classic album that you're going to get in trouble for I'll redo that record and maybe we can just make it a quick album where it's just like a pandemic style studio release where we, uh, what if I get Dave Lombardo and Stu Block to do their parts, redo the parts, but give them three takes of every song. So no studio tricks, no fixing with auto tune and all this stuff, no getting it perfect. Not like a real badass Andy Sneap Exodus album. Mm -hmm. Uh, I want this to be like, hey, let's see what you guys got. Let's do it. I mean, these are legends, right? Like talent wise. And Dave is a legend for other reasons, obviously. But they were shocked because they wanted to know, okay, what do you want us to do? And I was on a conference like this with them. And I said, nothing. Do three takes of each. Do whatever the hell you want. And mm -hmm. he left the conversation thinking he'd do what he wanted. And Dave goes, Jeff, listen, what do you mean? Do what we want. And I go, well, just do what you want. What about, like, what do you want me to do in all these parts? Do you want me to follow Mike Mangini? Do you want me to 
make up some new things? Do you want me to send you demos so I could try different things? I said, no, Dave, you're Dave Lombardo, for Christ's sakes. <laughs> do whatever you want to do. <laughs> exactly. And then I realized that Stu and Dave, in their careers, must have had a producer and or a band leader, like a guitar player, like a Kerry King or whatever, mm -hmm. or Hanneman, saying, Dave, play that. It's better. Do this. Why don't you play that? This is our riff. Play to this. They, our producer would have definitely said, do that or try this. You saw it with Metallica, with Bob Rock. Even the biggest band in the world in metal was told yes and no by the producer. So I realized John Schaefer from Ice Earth probably told Stu what he wanted. And that's part of the gig. So I didn't realize I was paying these guys good money, paying them on time when I said I would. And they had 100% free reign to do anything they wanted. So I think I shocked them both. And they're like scratching their heads. And at the end of the recording, they both said, hey, Jeff, hey, next time you want to do an Annihilator record or some recording, hey, uh, maybe I can be involved. And I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, I'm, you know, I'm thinking like, OK, the Jeff Waters serious guy in the studio and it's my album, my band, all that shit. OK, mm -hmm. that's fucking awesome. That's great. But as a fan, which I always am, it's literally I couldn't actually stop for letting Dave know how much I was a fan of this guy. And uh, I always put it this way on this this new semi re-recording of this fun pandemic era mm -hmm. record, which is being released with the other one, too. So the original is not being shit on the original is still there if anybody wants that one too so my my top three things about the album were backwards was through Stu having Stu singing is fantastic it's a great new sound new, new style he was very nervous about what to sing he was like well in this song should i do like a phil anselmo thing and i was like dude do whatever you want so you've got a phil anselmo on the one song you've got him just trying things he was very nervous he didn't know what sound to, style to do so i kind of fucked with him on that because in the end he did some great stuff but he's really worried that people will think he's scattered and not not have a style and i'm like that's the fun about it let's you know you're a great singer just you just had fun but mm -hmm. number three was two number two best thing was and, and this is not including dedication to alexi leho my friend of many years and even an influence on both ways on the influence as well as uh eddie van halen passing and us doing a van halen cover that's on there Besides that, and besides having 12 very incredible, talented, and well-known guests, blah, 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 right? Besides all that cool shit, um, you've got Lombar uh, Stu Block on, and then you've got, number two, the rain and blood symbol, ride symbol, that Dave Lombardo used on Rain and Blood album. Oh, he wow. He pulled, pulled it out of the closet and said, I have a surprise for you. And he knew I was a fan, so he held up the symbol and said, this is the actual symbol that i did rain and blood with so that's number two best thing about it number one is the dave lombardo is the drummer so wow so he used the rain and blood symbol on the record on the re yeah. the, the re-recordings yeah. and as a fan that's the most coolest thing ever and as a musician uh studio guy that's the the incredible another incredible reason right that is so amazing that is so yeah. amazing Phew. So, okay I'll, I'll let you get a question in <laughs> <laughs> I love that. That was so cool. So metal is the one that you are re-releasing first. Are you going to go back and do the other records too? The first three? Is that what you said? No, no. Um, that that's what I wouldn't do. Um, oh, you wouldn't do? I, no, I wouldn't retouch or redo. As tempting as it is, I think some bands go back to the roots because they weren't happy with the original production, which mm -hmm. is clear with a lot of bands. Some of my favorite albums, the the sounds were terrible, but it's that's what it was it was like amazing and redoing it you're never going to recapture it but right. I, I understand for money or because they need money or because it was just an artistic thing they hated the sound then redo it you have the means go for it mm -hmm. but i was like oh yeah i could redo those albums and make them sound better and then i and i actually heard a few of those redone things and said oh shit I'm going to get killed if I do that. It is no way. It, it's just a target. You're a target because let that, for me, it was like, just let that be in the past and whatever. But if you're going to do redo anything, pick an album that, especially in North America, people don't know. Mm -hmm. And 
it's got the honest gimmick of having i say gimmick because people take that word as like a, a, a dishonest thing the the sort of attention getting the sort of cool thing about it is having i won't even name them all the 12 musicians on there plus dave and Stu are ridiculous They're like from lips from anvil all the way to willie from lamb of god to you know trivium to uh you know what i'm saying like just just cool musicians and in, in, in their own things and there's a mutual thing in all of those there's influence both ways or one way in, or friendships in all of those guests um so that is like there's just too many cool things about it and for it to sort of go under the radar because me and dave pad and mike mangini just had the perfect storm of that wasn't our best album together. Uh, I had to redo this and what a perfect way to end that catalog thing for me was to introduce it like this. <laughs> yeah. What a great, yeah. What a great way to do it. I, and to get the, those people on the album as well. I mean, that must've been a huge moment for you. Yeah. And another thing too, if you look up the names of the guests on the metal two or metal one record, mm -hmm. an interesting point, Stu and Dave Lombardo were paid to do it because that's how it works. And, and it's also pandemic. Everybody, if you got money, you pay these people well, if you have it, because I'm not, not saying those specific people, but fuck sakes, everybody's hurting right now. So mm -hmm. if anybody out there is in a good position, um, whether it's you own a, you own a, a shop or a, a music company that is now a, a thriving company because home recording equipment two years ago year and a half ago just took off through the roof and you own a company that was worth 20 million and now because of the pandemic it's worth 150 million and that's an actual example um i'm not some saint but i would say hey man give back what the hell's going on give back go and re you know help pet rescue places where people can't afford to feed the damn pets because uh, they got a new puppy before the pandemic and bang this poor little thing's like beaten or it's out on the street or left on a on a hilltop or something that's not a joke that's serious shit that's happening everywhere donate or help with that go help you know uh victims of domestic assault because those have doubled tripled whatever oh yeah alcohol drug rehabs starving uh people just I mean, fuck, anybody who's doing good in the world right now mm -hmm. should be helping someone else. If you want to just be an, you know, I'm not a religious guy, but if there was such thing as a heaven, you're going to go to it if you do something nice for people that need something. Mm -hmm. And I've tried to do that after I got off all my crazy medical issues. Uh, it, you know, it, I haven't turned to Jesus or none of that stuff. Uh, but what I've done is I went, well, I was trying to be a better person for the last bunch of years, mm -hmm. but I need to help puppies out um and and you know just you know i gave a console to a local a, a recording console i didn't ask for money i gave a console to a place that was hurting during this wow. thing and little things like that and and even talking to some people right like not you but talking to like actual people that might need a a break in their day or whatever and even right. pep talks pep talks to musicians that we know that are somewhere around my little level in, in the music business in Europe or even the States that are, you know, maybe a little bit more known than my band, but are really hurting because they didn't plan or have as much luck or plan on the, the financial dead time and no touring or, or they got fucked over by labels, managers, whoever the hell it was. Right. 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 So I think anybody let, let, for example, if you have a, again i go back to that example there's so many and i'm so into the recording studio business for so long i've had four or five studios in canada and and over here now mm -hmm. um in durham uk um and i watch at the beginning of the pandemic i was like talking to some of these companies thinking yeah are you guys okay if you had to lay off all these people and all that and and some of them were going well we laid off some people but we're selling about 15 to 25 times more product because of the home recording that's happening now, because everybody's stuck at their apartment or in their homes and they're making a killing off this. Imagine the people that remember the shortage of web cameras and software and 
and, and things, you know, the software company, Zoom, whatever, they've just went through the roof for the last few years. But all the microphones, the USB mics, the focus right thing you got sitting there. Yeah. All the scarlets I mean, are like <laughs> it got her, you know what? I've got one again, I'm showing off because I deserve this one. Because it's true. I have one of the most badass studios, okay? I have uh -huh. the same unit. I have the same unit in my computer room. I'm using that to run my headphone monitors. Oh, and, really? Yeah, in in the most badass studio, Jeff says. Um, but <laughs> those guys right there, do you know how many they would have sold and how much profit? Their only issues have been we can't make them fast enough from all the different countries to get it to our new orders. So that's crazy. So all those people, and that's just that sector of the world. Imagine mask makers um anything to do oh, with yeah. audio anything to do with internet audio software all this kind of stuff um it would be great to see people and i'm sure a lot of them are good people and i'm sure a lot of them are giving to charity and doing the right things mm -hmm. they are kind of are in a way by even having the product available in a way but um i gotta say just a, a personal thing that I, i'm never political or talk about this stuff in interviews or in my life with an eyelider because even before the internet, I was aware that if I started taking a stance on something or stepping what I thought was out of my bounds, a lot of people say, if you've got any influence at all, use it for good. But what of course happens is a lot of people use it for their opinion, or it doesn't mean it's for good, or it could be the wrong opinion or something that could hurt people or, or incite something or do the wrong things, but, um, and use it for money or power or whatever the fuck it is, who cares? But I always was conscious that the most I ever dove into delve, dove into politics was I'd have a song called Stonewall. And it was simply about me looking into a Vancouver river, seeing the pollution and figuring, knowing nothing about politics, that it must be these terrible corporations spewing chemicals into the, the river and the, the air and the rich people of the world are this, this quite enough bad people in the world running these things that they're destroying the earth. And I was actually right. Um, but I knew, I knew nothing about the, the hierarchy or how this works. Mm -hmm. And I could remember when I was in high school and in Canada, that was nine to 13 grades. Mm -hmm. And I was entering high school in grade nine when Dan Beeler, the drummer singer from the band Exciter, who was one of the, the, those were the founders almost of speed metal. And people don't know that one. The big four know it and everybody else knows, but Exciter in their day were likely one of the top bands or the top band that started speed metal they took motorhead and the judas priest hellbent for leather era and they made it speed metal it was it was amazing but anyway i was that time i went into high school and he was leaving and in ottawa canada and there was these two punk rock guys that had pink and blue hair mm -hmm. mohawks and i was kind of laughing chuckling at them smiling when i looked at them because Oh, there goes the two punk rockers. They, they were dressed in the part. They had GBH, Dead Kennedys, DOA. They had all these bands on their on their jackets, Jacket. <laughs> and Butt and flat. they were walking the talk. They were looking like the deal. But we were as metalheads. We had the studded jackets, and we had the you know we had that, and the long hair. But they were talking political. They were talking about all these things that their ba favorite bands were talking about politics, and how there's these people that run the world that have all this power and clearly to get there you probably needed money too and then you have the people that just have the money and the corporation boss then you have the governments and the investors and you have a, and then you have the people the locals and then local government and then you have the people and all this stuff and they had all these what i thought were like you know conspiracy theories in the 70s of how this works and I just cruised through ignorantly about politics and about the way the world works and the way it really works. And I skimmed through to, I was at least 53 years old. I'm 55 now, but it took me to 53 years old to realize and watch this pandemic go down, and watch the leader of this country in England. I can't say anything about it. It's just mind blowing. And to watch my, my former residency country, my citizenship is Canadian and that's my home, right? But I live in England to watch what's going on with the, the way that that leadership is going and to watch the division from to Republicans to Democrats in the states and Antifa, Black Lives Matter, and all the stuff going on that's in, trying to divide us because that's how things get done in the upper echelons. 
-hmm. and you've got all this hate and division and this against this and that and to walk, sit back during covid and be go through a few surgeries recoveries worry about your own health and life and to sit back completely drug alcohol free except codeine i was hooked on that fucking thing for about six months but off um but essentially i've been clean for, since 21 years ago and wow. that's but awesome to, it was great but i was also eating terrible shit that was making me extremely unhealthy inside just chemicals and junk and pizza and takeout all the time and pure sugar stuff and i was killing myself but anyway and and that led to a lot of the health problems i had last year wow. um, and it probably led to how well and badly i fought off the covid thing too of course i was not in good immune shape and mm -hmm. uh, but moving on if you go back to what those kids were saying in high school 16 15 year olds that they were learning from some of those pop punk not, at that time pop punk album, the commercial punk bands you know like the exploited gba the dead kennedys they were like we look back and they go well, they were milking the image and the this just like the metal guys were doing but they were fucking right a lot of those those kids they had it down 16 15 year old punk rock kids in high school that the other kids laughed at and i smiled at they were the ones that knew how this world was actually run and they had mm -hmm. they had it right from the beginning from their punk rock bands that they listened to the powerful that run it the people that have all the money the corporations the governments local <laughs> and down to the people and right. the one thing i got from this whole thing it's not about anti-vax and vax or about democrats or republican or about left and right in canada or or the clown here in England, the clown show here in England, one of the greatest countries. Look, I'm a Canadian, so you people around the world go, oh, maple syrup, ha ha, moose, ha ha, igloos, ha ha ha, fucking polar bears, ha ha, uh, Bob and Doug McKenzie, uh, A, you know, you've got all the oh, stereotypes. Sure. Believe yeah. me, the United States has stereotypes too. Um, oh, yeah, I'm when sure. You, when you, when you, and you guys are even got it worse because you've literally got more than 50 countries within one country. You guys have this badass thing that's hard to manage federally and hard to manage as a one country, like one federal thing, mm -hmm. but you've got all the different rules and, you know, states wide. But the beauty is too, is that I can, and I did this for like 25 years, I would tour the rest of the world, but vacation in Canada and the United States. So I would literally go camping in Kentucky or I'd drive, fly to Vegas and gamble, or I'd go to Seattle to see shows or I'd go down to Florida hang out with Chris Jericho at his house for a few weeks, go see <laughs> wrestling matches, or I'd go, you know, New York, Chris Caffrey, Trans-Siberian Orchestra, Sabotage, just hang out. States is my, one of my most visited places I've ever, well, is my most visited place. But it's like driving through country. You go to another state and you can be in another country. Oh, and you yeah. keep going. So, oh, yeah. So it's like, I watched the leaders. Okay, you see the divisive stuff and you see all this dividing. And um, <sighs> you sit back and you go when you're sober and clean and you you don't take sides. You just sort of use your your at least well-traveled brain, uh, not educated in, in the sense of schooling or in, in politics, but and just educated in, in people and life and travel. And common sense has to come in there if you clean up and you got decades of you know, finally learning what finances are and future and, uh oh, I'm in trouble if I don't get my shit together. And, you know, oh, by the way, you are going to die someday. So you might as well think about what you're doing now. You know, once you grow out of that, hopefully grow out of that earlier phase of being young and, and you know, everything's fucking awesome and you'll never die. Um, you hope that you have this awakening where it doesn't have to be religious. It doesn't have to be anything like that. It can just be like, I want to clean up. I want to be a better person. Be, be and and do something that's kind of cool and i can say that with some of my music for what it did for some people i wrote songs about alcoholism and depression and things i went through and my people dying of cancer i've had an aunt that died of cancer and i apparently wrote a song called phoenix rising that was helped a lot of people through so you know so you, i can use the excuse that i've done a few good things and made people smile at the concerts but that's a spinoff of me getting something from it and getting my creative stuff out that I benefited from that. But, and that's good that people, secondary people got something good out of some of it. 
but I wanted to start doing good things for other people that weren't to do with the music, just stuff mm -hmm. like serious stuff I could really help someone with. Uh, so I'm trying, that's in the phase of my life I'm in now. I want to keep doing music and do different things mm -hmm. full time. But in between, I'm going to, instead of doing other stuff, I'm going to try to hopefully do a few good things. Um, I love that. So it was really depressing for me to watch the last year and a half and watch my friends in the United States publicly take sides online and totally fuck their reputations up on social media for life and be right away pigeonhole or okay that one's a racist or that one's an anti-vaxxer or that was a pro-vax mm -hmm. or this is a democrat that's a republican and the same thing in england same thing everywhere around the world my german friends and dutch friends have very strong opinions about the americans and the canadians and we have opinions of the americans and the british and the french and so about who's doing the right things and who's doing the wrong things in the last few years mm -hmm. but the bottom line is i in personally realized we're all most of us in this world are getting completely screwed over and people are taking advantage up in those couple of echelons at the top are taking advantage of us and i really am disappointed i'm seeing some positive stuff people are starting to awaken and i'm not talking about awakening bullshit or the the movements or any of this i'm talking about my version of it which is uh, of this is people are starting to wake up and, and understand that you're you're to go and say something on social media the fact that i have to worry now that i might ruin my career somebody or something has killed my free speech and that's what musicians and artists were able to do forever in most countries in most generations lately we're allowed to speak our mind and have opinions as long as it's not blatantly mean and racist and murderous or conspiracy to murder or child this or that as long as it's within boundaries of reasonable to have our own opinions and put it online or socially or say it to a friend somebody has intentionally taken that away by making social media a one-sided event mm -hmm. from a political side and it's like wait so you mean the other political people don't have access to social media because they're being owned and run by the other political parties uh members so you've got these around the world not the united states the world you've got the countries that are literally having leaders that I was hoping would be honest and proper to the people, because this is a fucking human problem. This virus thing, we didn't know if this thing was gonna get worse and kill them all or get out there. We didn't know that. And many leaders acted appropriately. Maybe it took a while for them to get together, but they all came out and said, this is real, this is scary, we're fucked. And mm -hmm. they were right. But then you had the leaders, a lot of them, continued this on when they didn't need to, and media was getting controlled and told what to say and what not to say. So we had the BBC in England and the, the CBC in Canada. We're known as basically the most neutral that you're going to get out of the news media in the world. They were the two that were like, well, they're the most two-sided, both sides, three sides. They're not being run. They're not being run by the government or what to say or by corporations that own them and all that shit. They were the ones we could go to in the world for the neutrality there, the, the real, and I call that news. I think most people understand that's news. News was originally meant to be the different sides of the story, the different political parties, and include the third party and the fourth party. Get them all in there. Could include all races and both sides to race issues, both sides to everything. And within boundaries but include it all and i watched in the pandemic while my favorite neutral canadian news organization went one way and while the british press two of them sky news went not as far as bbc but bbc that was the trusted one it turned into a cnn so it was uh it was a it was like wait a second that's not news so there should be a bot here's my new president of the world jeff waters <laughs> I'll inst I institute a multi-racial country panel of 12 people and these 12 people are going to have a history of being honest good people 
that have a fucking awesome record and if they've done something wrong have they went and tried to fix it and re not repent what's the word make up for yeah and find there's so many people in the world like this find the 12 that know their shit and they have to be reasonable people they don't have to be big powerful people in fact forget that 12 common sense people who who whether you're any color will sit there and use common sense almost like a jury but make sure that you pull that jury and make sure you've got 12 honest people and let them make decisions on what is a news organization are they allowed to call themselves news or should they call themselves a something else so that you know what you're getting where their affiliation is whether they're being influenced and only allow these 12 people certify only news organizations that can be broadcast on TV and to the world that can have the name news associated with them. It's got to be neutral. It's got to be neutral. And then if, if somebody's a, a crook amongst the 12, you fire their ass out and you give them a fine <laughs> and you, you, you publicly shame them. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. You don't have to, they'll be shamed anyway. Um, right. But, but do that. Get, forget this Western world G7, forget all this shit. Forget the World Health Organization. Forget Republican, Democrat. You know, oh, Canada's such a nice country. Shit. It's, we're all fucked. We're all getting screwed over with, hey, we're all fucked if we can't just get on a plane and go visit our family. Uh -huh. We're all fucked if we have any of these crazy post-traumatic stress, stress feelings about going to hug a relative or a dying this or that, or we, we're not able to go in for treatments for something because we're not tested quick and i mean we're not you know i'm sorry we can't let you in you're dying of a heart attack but you haven't been tested yet we got to test you first right and right, then, right and we can't treat your heart attack till we get the the, the quick thing the swabbed test back done. right yeah so i mean whatever i don't know if that's a good example but my point is i was so disappointed by how ignorant i was and how expectations i had of all of these well-known politicians and leaders of the world that owe it to the public they, they were elected or whatever to be and even the dictators for Christ's sakes at least take this subject seriously it's a humanity issue forget the politics tell the people upstairs to fuck off and run your country so that we're healthy and mentally healthy again and things can get back to some form of normal and support the people and when your speeches come in make everybody feel like there's hope and that everything's going to be all right mm -hmm. and then mm -hmm. your people will be behind you it won't be political and you'll be doing the right thing and you'll go to heaven if there is a heaven and hell right <laughs> so which i'm not religious in any way but you know what i'm saying mm -hmm. um so i was so disappointed at how these leaders i thought would do the right thing aren't and i didn't realize how I was totally ignorant to how that political thing really works in most countries. Mm -hmm. And I should not have had hope that these people would have done the right things. And the right things were usually right after the pandemic started. And we knew it was a bad thing. The game started the uh, giving, uh, you know, your neighbor down the street or your, your lover's brother, the contracts for the new mask company that that, that guy's company didn't make masks but mm -hmm. now he's got 300 million to make masks and you know, like all the contracts and all the, you know, telling us that, Oh boy, you have to do this and that. And then you see secret video of it coming out here in England. Well, at the time we were being told locked down and you can't do this. You can't do that. The prime minister of England was having a fucking party <laughs> and the video, the, the, the stuff came out, nobody wore masks. They were in enclosed places drinking together. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying, right? Yeah, and it's do like I say now as I do. And you know what? As much as you and I are smiling because it's a fucking joke, uh, <laughs> there was there was there was people in this country where I live uh -huh. who were couldn't see their their kids, their parents, their family, their grandparents in the hospital because this prick was giving these orders out that you need to do this because you're all gonna die. And then he's having a fucking party in the uh number 10 Downing Street, whatever the headquarters are called. And this is all over the news for the last week. And it, there's been calls for him to get the fuck out now. So I can tell you, if you had a neutral media 
that was showing both sides for the last few years in the United States, you would be getting footage like that on the news of the same shit happening, just a different circumstance. Mm -hmm. uh, of all the different issues that you guys have, Canada the same, France the same, I'm sure everybody else would have the same problem. Shame on the shame on these people for not doing that one thing where they needed to do the right thing. That's all I got to say. No, I, I think well Woo. said, well said. <laughs> well, I appreciate your time, Jeff. This has been oh. amazing. I, I know the uh, Metal 2 records coming out in February, correct? With all oh, the yeah. guests on it. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it's kind of a kickoff to the, the 20 title release that um, some countries will be buying this up like hotcakes some people some of these records some won't even know who we are but the point is announce the catalog maybe some people will go hey who's this band or whatever in canada and the states and our hardcore fans and the other places will go yes awesome we get these remaster re, re whatever catalog with these bonus things and great packaging the usual and that'll be the final version and I can put it to bed and, and it's sanctioned by me, so to speak and whatever. Um, but it also makes sure for me that it's available to anyone who wants to discover the band mm -hmm. and, uh, or found a few early records and then lost touch and wants to see what's up. You're going to, if that's you, you're going to like some things, some albums, you're not going to like some, you're going to like some singers. You won't like other singers. You might like some songs and maybe you don't like the other eight songs, but there's something in there you're going to like. There's uh, if you include the first three albums, there's literally 180 original songs from Annihilator available. Wow. And you, maybe you've only heard one. So mm -hmm. you can't tell me there's only one good song in the catalog. <laughs> <laughs> just well, hey, I... just down, download the one song. You'll be fine. You don't have to even buy the whole album, you know? Yeah, there you go. Well, I appreciate your time, Jeff. This has been great. I do have one quick question for you left. I want to know if you have any advice for aspiring artists. Well, today I'm a bad person to ask because obviously everything's changed in the music business and then also double that to the pandemic. So mm -hmm. if forget the pandemic, pre-pandemic, I would still say I'm not really the guy to, to ask um, in a way. At the same time, some of the old school methods apply is in my old school and for my career from my perspective getting clean was a big issue i couldn't have one or two drinks i'd have to go out and get wasted all weekend mm -hmm. i and then it crept into nightly and never before a gig so i was righteous there right and after the gig i'd be wasted so mm -hmm. longevity is important if this is what you really want to do if you sit down and go i want to be a musician seriously and i want it as a career then your number one goal is you can't get hooked on stuff you've got to take care of your health that's a, a dad or a grandpa thing but that's directly a fact when it comes to how long you're going to be in the business today it's 10 times harder to make a living so all the more reason to stay clean also because of today's um not pandemic just today's era you should really try if you're a bassist try to write lyrics try to sing try to play guitar write some riffs the guys writing the songs are the guys that are going to be the ones that are going to be able to survive and maybe you can't find a drummer well then program the drum software if you you know learn how to play bass find out what other bass players do do they match the guitar or do they do something totally different learn how to record not just crappy stuff learn how to really it's online now. In the old days, I used to buy, have to buy three magazines a week. Um, it's online. Every, every good producer, engineer out there and mixer is telling you the secrets. Go for it. You can do it with cheap equipment. We can get those sapphires and make some pretty damn re good recordings. So learn all about all the instruments. Even if you're no good at some of them or most of them, just learn it anyway because you might happen. You might have to do that. You might have to record this. You might not be able to find a musician in your city that's any good or wants to work with an unknown kid, right? Then do it yourself. Learn. Learn how everybody else did it. The days of the band are tough right now because you're not even allowed to see the other person depending on what country you're in. Um, learn about the business. The, the beauty of today, the best part is, 
almost anything you could ever need to learn is actually waiting for you on the internet. So it's there. You just got to figure out what works for you, what you want to do. And if you don't have a goal, no point in looking in the internet. If you don't have a goal, what's the point of looking at what you got to do? You need the goal. Do you want to be a session player? Then you need to learn about studio and how to be a session player. Do you want to play live? Well, do you want to be a soul musician? Do you want to be in a band? Do you want to be hired? There's all these different options. It's still there for you. You just got to get the right goal, research it, and then forget what you're told today. The, the majority of bands that were successful in the 70s, 80s, 90s, 60s, whatever, and 90s were doing it full time. And that means when they weren't making money, they didn't even have a band, maybe they hadn't played shows. They were doing it full time because essentially, I'd say 98% of the successful bands out there were not working two jobs or three jobs to support their band. They were like, okay, my mom's, I got to borrow money off my mom. My girlfriend's helping me out. I'm not saying you should do this, but the cheap, the cheap, as Gene Simmons said, the cheapest bank loan you can get to start your career is your mom and dad, if you can do it. Right. <laughs> so, and that's true. If, and my parents didn't give me the loans, but they gave me the start. They helped me with my flight to Vancouver to start finding musicians. They gave me hundred dollars spending money. Right. And they said, if you're ever in trouble, you could always come home. So I had that safety, but I needed to learn. I didn't need my mom and dad to give me money, like tons of money. I had to learn how to do this on my own. So I suffered and struggled for a couple of years uh, to the point of actual starvation physically. I went down to a ridiculous weight. I had no food until the landlord in the apartment I was renting and his wife noticed I was starving and took me in literally down the hall and fed me. So wow. yeah, that was when I was doing the Alice in Hell record recording. So I'm not saying you need to starve. I'm not saying you need to be a bum. I'm not saying you need to leech money off people. I'm saying if you, it's an odds game. If you really want it and you think you have the talent, you need to learn everything you can about the music, the songwriting, the, uh, the technical stuff, all the record company and the current modern day ways of, of touring, getting signed, publishing what that is. And, and, but you also have to say, am I doing it full time or do I want it handed to me? Like a lot of, a lot of the me generation that wants instant success and thinks I'm going to do a TikTok thing and an Instagram or whatever, and have that big hit. And you watch that attitude has spawned millions and tens of millions of say girls who think they're going to be models, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I, right. And same with guys, but I'm just saying it's different being a, uh, having a daughter today than it was back then. The influence of the Kardashians and the, all that kind of stuff on society and social media is there's a, a big amount of girls growing up now that think that in lip injections, fake boobs, Instagram model uh, endorsements from that are lucrative, et cetera, et cetera. But what they, they don't understand is it's Hollywood again. You're going to get the lure, but you're going to do these. It's even worse than Hollywood. You're going to physically alter yourself and maybe regret it someday or have complications. But the, the amount of the percentage of Instagram models making money versus the amount trying is insane. Slim and you end up right? yeah. you end up being 26 year old girl intelligent girl who's had good looks who may have done something to their looks they might regret regret but they have no education and they're they're let down and then they go they go to the dark side if they have to right mm -hmm. so i don't even know what i'm talking about all i have to say is the musician thing i really believe it's a you can do it today and you've got more resources than ever before the business is more horrendous than it ever was. It's 98% crooked criminal. So know that from the onset, you might find some honest people. And if you can gravitate to the honest people, but you won't know they're honest until they fucked you over or else they, or else they've made you money and done good things for you. And maybe they're honest. Maybe they're actually doing what they're, they say they're going to do. Right. Um, but, the luck of the draw and researching who you're going to work with is important. Uh, stay healthy and learn everything you can about it. But mainly is 
don't fool yourself. If you want that quick Instagram success, you, you might get it, but your odds are, it's like a lottery ticket. Forget it. You might as well actually work your ass off and feel good about what you're doing.